I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkenstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to episode 140 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. We welcome Alan Eskins today. He is the author of Nothing More Dangerous. Alan Eskins is the best-selling author of The Life We Bury, The Guise of Another, The Heavens May Fall, The Deep Dark Descending, The Shadows We Hide, and Nothing More Dangerous. He is the recipient of the Barry Award, Minnesota Book Award, Rosebud Award from Left Coast Prime and Silver Fauchion Award, and has been a finalist for the Edgar Award, Thriller Award, and Anthony Award. His books have been translated into 26 languages. Allen has a journalism degree from the University of Minnesota and a law degree from Hamline University. After law school, he studied creative writing in the MFA program at Minnesota State University, Mankato, as well as the Loft Literary Center and the Iowa Summer Writers Festival. Allen grew up on the hills of central Missouri. He now lives with his wife, Jolie, in greater Minnesota, where he recently retired after practicing criminal law for 25 years. Nothing more dangerous. In a small town where loyalty to family and to, quote, your people carries the weight of a sacred oath, defying those unspoken rules can be a deadly proposition. After 15 years of growing up in the Ozark Hills with his widowed mother, high school freshman Bodie Sandin is beyond ready to move on. He dreams of glass towers and cityscapes, driven by his desire to be anywhere other than Jessup, Missouri. The new kid at St. Ignatius High School, if he isn't being pushed around, he is being completely ignored. Even his beloved woods, his playground as a child, and his sanctuary as he grew older seemed to be closing in on him, suffocating him. Then Thomas Elgin moves in across the road, and Bodie's life begins to twist and turn. Coming to know the Elgins, a black family settling into the community where notions of us and them carry the weight of history, forces Bodie to rethink his understanding of the world he's taking for granted. Secrets hidden in plain sight begin to unfold. The mother who wraps herself in the loss of her husband, the neighbor who carries the wounds of a mysterious past that he holds close, the quiet boss who is fighting his own hidden battle. But the biggest secret of all is the disappearance of Lida Poe, the African-American woman who keeps the books at the local plastics factory. Word has it that Ms. Poe left town along with $100,000 of company money. Although Bodie has never met the missing woman, he discovers that the threads of her life are woven into the deepest fabric of his world. As the mystery of her fate plays out, Bodie begins to see the stark lines of race and class that both bind and divide this small town, and he will be forced to choose sides. I'd like to welcome Alan Eskins to the program. He is author of Nothing More Dangerous. Welcome, Alan. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. This book took our breath away. It began slowly and built into a powerful message about the evil of bigotry and discrimination in many forms. Was the timing of the release of this book a result of some of the social problems we are going through today? Actually, no. I started writing this book in 1992. I just gotten out of law school. I was looking for something to exercise my creative side. I initially went to college as a theater major, so I had this really strong urge to be creative. And I'd never written anything. I'd never taken a class in writing, but I wanted to do something creative. So I sat down and I wrote a short story about this 15-year-old boy. 
And I liked the short story that I wrote. So I started studying writing, first reading books on writing technique and then taking a lot of classes. I have three quarters of an MFA degree and over 20 years, I studied writing because I wanted to make this story better. And I just kept building on it and building on it. After 20 years, it wasn't ready. So I put it aside and wrote my debut novel. Then I wrote four more novels in between. And then I went back, pulled this book out and rewrote it from beginning to end. So the timing of it was really more an aspect of when the story itself was finally ready. The message in this book was written in the 1990s about my experiences in the 1970s and the fact that it came out last year ahead of the George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter explosion that we saw this spring was really just coincidence of timing. Well, they say there are no coincidences. The older characters you include in your novels, like Carl Iverson in The Life We Bury and Hope Gardner in Nothing More Dangerous, for instance, introduce elements of wisdom gained through life experience. Were you fortunate enough to have had the benefit of that wisdom in your life? I think that rather than having a single mentor character in my life, I've had many people who have guided me, starting with teachers and my parents. And as I grew older, it became friends. I like having a character in my stories that is kind of a guiding force for The Life We Bury, where my protagonist is a college student and nothing more dangerous. My protagonist is 15 years old. It makes sense to have that mentor character be some older, wiser figure in the story, where in my other stories, it'll be more more of a peer that is the mentor character. Nothing More Dangerous takes place in 1976. As I was reading this, I couldn't help but remember that time. I was younger. I was about nine at that time. It really took me back. But this was a time before internet and cell phones. Was it difficult to take yourself out of this time and place yourself back into that world? It actually was not. Bodhi is kind of a alter ego of me. So I grew up in the 1970s. I would have been, I think, a year younger than Bodhi in 1976. So it was simply me going back to my teenage years, remembering the angst, remembering the insecurities, and remembering having to live life where you had to memorize phone numbers and go back to when drive-ins were popular. And so it was really just me remembering things from my youth. I grew up in Missouri. The story takes place in a fictional town called Jessup, Missouri. I lived out in the woods. The things that Bodhi does out in the woods were things that I did out in the woods. The conversations that Bodhi has, the racial jokes and racial slurs in this novel, those are all things that I said or heard growing up. So there's an authenticity to it that comes from my own experience of living in that era and in that world. That was probably the thing I liked most about the book was the fact that this was told through a teenager's eyes. And I thought he was such a great character. Why did you decide to approach it that way? Well, it is actually an adult looking back. I start out the story by saying when I was 15 years old, when I learned Lida Poe had gone missing. After that, I step into Bodhi as a 15 year old and I live the story through Bodhi's eyes. When I get later, in the novel, there are some references to the fact that this is an older person. For example, I say later when I was in college and I talked to my mother about this, it does come back to the adult narrator at the end of the story. But I want the reader to live that experience the way Bodhi lived it. And so I don't go back and forth in that narrative voice. And then I jump into Bodhi and I stay as Bodhi through the rest of the story until the end because I wanted the reader to see it through a teenager's eyes. I wanted them to experience it the way he would have. We have been fans of yours since the life we bury, and you're a master at emotionally connecting the reader to your characters. How do you invoke such feelings in your stories? That is an enormous question. There are actually books devoted just to the psychology of putting emotion into stories. There are so many techniques. I was fortunate in my approach to becoming a writer in that I already had a career as an attorney, so I wasn't in a hurry to get my first book out there. I was writing for my own enjoyment and my own edification. Because of that, I was able to take classes and read books and then let things settle in and become kind of muscle memory as I'm going along, rather than have it be an academic exercise in writing. 
there's so many small techniques that go into this. Number one is you have to make your protagonist and actually all your characters, if you can, relatable. Now, what that means is as a reader is reading, they have to step into the shoes. They have to create an empathetic connection to the character. And so there are things you can do, such as there's the famous line that the save the cat moment. When you watch a movie, inevitably within the first few minutes, there's going to be a scene where the protagonist does something nice. Even if it's a really, really bad person, they'll do one thing nice, and that opens the door for empathy. You give your protagonist a lofty goal to reach. You give your protagonist problems that the everyday person can understand. Bodhi's dealing with insecurity at being at a new high school. He's estranged from his mother. There's this coldness between him and his mother. He wants to run away from home because he's not happy with who he is. There's all these little things that along the way, people will subconsciously think, I've been there. I know that. I've experienced that. And they'll put themselves in the shoes of the protagonist or of the character. Once you've got the reader engaged like that, you can start to evoke emotions. They start to feel what the character is feeling. It is my goal as a writer to evoke emotion. More than anything else, I want people to feel something when they read my works. I don't want it to be an intellectual exercise of solving a crime. I write mysteries, but that solving of a crime is a vehicle to tell the story of this person and the characters and the relationships. It's through that side of the story that I can evoke emotions. Leo Tolstoy once wrote, the purpose of art is to convey to others the deepest feelings of humankind. I think that as a writer, even a writer of mysteries, any genre, that should be your ultimate goal. And so when I'm writing a story, when I'm outlining a story, I'm looking not at only what's the twists and turns that are going to stimulate my reader's intellect, but where am I going to go deep into the story and make them feel something? I'm so glad you said that. Reading all of your books, that's exactly what I experienced. I cared so deeply about almost each and every one of the characters, even the ones that you may not love them, but you just did such a good job of making you understand why their actions were the way they were. All your characters are so good, but one of the characters that really spoke out to me, and I guess because I'm a mom, was Bodhi's mother. She starts out as a depressed widow, but she develops a friendship with the Elgin family, and it kind of brings her back to life. Was her story planned before the book started, or did the progression come together as the book progressed? A little bit of both. She started out as this depressed person. She never quite got over the death of her husband and Bodhi's father. That was, as I just spoke before, you give your protagonist these problems that people can understand. Well, the loss of his father was one of those problems. The distance between he and his mother was one of those problems. She was created to be one of the burdens that Bodhi was carrying at the beginning of the story. With that said, as I developed the novel over years, I realized that I wanted to give as many people in this novel their own journey. And so Bodhi's mother had a journey her journey was really one of the ones that kind of surprised me. I mean, I knew she was going to come out of her shell, that that was going to be brought about by the Elgins. But the final scene of the novel where she sings, that happened as I'm writing. And it was just one of those, oh, this is what I've been looking for for this woman. And so I was able to put this journey in and the culmination of the journey is her singing at the end of the novel. So it was a little bit of both. It came about as the story developed, but it started out as a necessary weight or burden for Bodhi to bear. That scene brought tears to my eyes. I've grown up to be someone who likes to make people cry. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. We met Bodhi in The Life We Bury as an adult. Of course, this features Bodhi as a teenager. In future books, will we see more of Bodhi's story, past and present? Present, yes. When I was writing The Life We Bury, I had already written this manuscript for Nothing More Dangerous, and I had it sitting aside. So I knew Bodhi as a teenager. As I was writing The Life We Bury, I was creating this character who was a law professor. And it occurred to me that Bodhi as a 15-year-old and this law professor were really aspects of who I was when I was 15 and who I became, having gone to college and law school. And so that's how Bodhi Sandin made his appearance in The Life We Bury. He actually existed as a teenager first, and then I added him. And I'm glad I did because it ties all my novels together. 
And also, as you're reading Nothing More Dangerous, if you've read The Life We Bury or The Heavens May Fall, where Bodhisattva is a co-protagonist as an adult, as you're reading Nothing More Dangerous, when he's a teenager, you will see these little hints, these little Easter eggs. He starts out by saying, I'm not college material. I'm not smart enough to go to college. And at the end, he's convinced himself that maybe, maybe I can do this. Those people who have read the other novels know he does actually go to college in law school. So you get to see this progression in Nothing More Dangerous that has already come to fruition if you've read the other novels. Now, he is a law professor who runs the Innocence Project. As someone who runs the Innocence Project, there's a lot of fodder there for his own story as an adult. And I have an idea for three novels out going back to Bodhi as an adult. I don't 